please welcome this evening's guest moderator, Nigel Smith from IndieWire, and tonight's guest, Lassa Halstrom. So welcome, thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, so this marks, some of uh, the folks here probably aren't aware that this marks your second Nicholas Sparks film adaptation following um, your last successful endeavor, Dear John. And I want to know how your first um, film with him came about. I got a script um, by Marty Bowen, the producer, um, and uh, I had never done anything like that before. But I am attracted to stories that are driven by character. Uh, and I usually shy away from uh, stories that are driven by plot, almost sacrificing character for that plot. So I found something interesting in that story. And it was emotional and powerful. I wanted to experiment in that genre. Mm -hmm. Now, like Dear John, um, you know, this film is obviously a love story and it's character driven, like you said, you know, Dear John was. But it also differs in a great respect in the fact that, you know, this film is largely a thriller, um, as the trailer made very, very clear. Is that what appealed to you about kind of returning to the, the Sparks world, the fact that, you know, the stories are somewhat dissimilar in, uh, in the way the action unfolds? It was certainly part of the attraction that there was another element to it. And I've up to the point, I actually shot uh, a thriller in Sweden last year. Mm -hmm. I made two movies in one year, one thriller in Sweden. Which was shortlisted for the Academy uh, Awards, right? Yes. Yeah. And then uh, a romance thriller, which we shot last summer, so I've been busy. And also busy experimenting in a genre that was totally foreign to me just a year ago. Mm -hmm. Were you at all wary of, you know, being labeled the, uh, the Nicholas Sparks uh, auteur? Yes, yes I am, yeah. of course, yeah. Uh, I am drawn to uh, character-driven stories. That's, I'm not ashamed of that. And I, I really like the opportunity to tell the story that was so uh, low-key in its tone. It's a, almost like a documentary uh, feel to it. It's uh, the, the romance developing in small, small increments and, uh, and the thriller aspect of the story is a driving, dramatic driving engine, you could say. Mm -hmm. So we have a clip, uh, three clip clips from the film and uh, we're going to set up the first one to share with our audience here. So can you give us a little bit of context about what we're about to see if you remember what the, the first scene um, is? This first one is She's met uh, a guy who owns a store, and she's going to repaint her her little cottage where she just moved in. Just and the he floors. helps her with the paint. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks. Now let's talk about your lead actress, Julianne Hough, who's pretty remarkable in this film because you know for much of the film her backstory is kind of hidden from the audience, but she crafts this really, you know, uh, indelible and winning uh, character that you root for, you know, even though you hardly really know anything about her <laughs> for much of the film. But, um, you know, you worked with Amanda Seyfried on your last Nicholas Sparks um, adaptation, who was, you know, kind of established in her own right at the outset. Um, but Julianne, you know, is mostly known as a dancer, and she's kind of an up-and-coming actress who's been making her mark, you know, over the last few years. What gave you the confidence that she had the uh, acting ability to pull a role like this off? Well, I didn't know much about her. I'd seen uh, Footloose and um, uh, Rock of Ages. That's all I know about her, really. I'd seen some clips from uh, from Dancing with the Stars. So I, I didn't see much range in those performances because uh, they didn't allow for it, really. But in the audition, I could see some um, spark of something else and, and a range that I'd never seen her in her, in the, the, in the material she's done. So I, we took a chance and hired her, and I think she did fantastic in the, in the part. And uh, I've been really asking all the actors to uh, be generous with uh, adding their own ideas. I really want to involve actors and crew on all levels on ideas. And so it's more like a, it's a truly collaborative effort. And uh, they improvised a lot, and it's so. I think this is 
has become alive because they're of their uh, contributions on all levels and also in improvising dialogue. And I, ne I never seen uh, Josh and Julian this good in the films I've seen so far. This is, they're loose and relaxed and they enjoyed, we enjoyed this summer together and I think the film shows that. It's a beautiful setting. I mean, you couldn't mm -hmm. ask for a more idyllic setting, but they also have a wa wonderful chemistry, a really kind of lived in quality. Um, mm -hmm. Did you have them audition together or did they just happen to really, uh, you know, get off as soon as they, um, as soon as they start filming together? They audition together. They spent like a week together just hanging out on set before we started shooting. We got to know each other. We don't rehearse really. I don't like rehearsing. We met and talked and f flipped through the script and rewrote it as we, <laughs> as we turned pages. And then we tried to th throw the script away as often as we could as we were shooting it. And I'd love to just roll those cameras. And with the digital cameras now, there's no costs involved apart from the time it takes to roll those cassettes, like 40 minutes on... Uh, uh, I c and I try to avoid breaking for slates because you lose that energy that you built up. So I keep rolling those cameras and, and it's pretty crazy. You should come visit. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to. Um, is this improv technique something new to you, you know, given the advent I've of the digital technology and the fact that you can keep shooting, or is this something you've always been doing throughout your I've career? I've always been doing this, but I've had to change cassette after 10 minutes when we did it on film. But I've been doing this almost as crazily as we did on this film, but this is the furthest I've gone with improvisation ever on a scripted story. So I tried to create sort of a documentary atmosphere on set, which meant not interfering too much, just giving some quick advice and just rolling those cameras. And that's really what I did to also counter the inherent sweetness in a Nicholas Spark story, to make it as real and as, as authentic as possible, to, to um, try to convey true sentiment uh, instead of sentimentality. There's quite a difference there. <laughs> and from what you're saying, it sounds like you kind of are given, or, you know, because you're obviously a respected, revered auteur, the, the, the free reign to, you know, make this material wholly your own by, by employing this technique. I mean, it w is that difficult to, to get by the screenwriters and the, you know, the source material, or was that no, easy No, the producers knew, knew I was working this way. It was kind of hard to convince the actors that I was really serious about this. Oh, okay. They thought it was like a trick maybe <laughs> in the beginning, but they learned pretty quickly that I was actually serious about going crazy with the improvisation to make it come alive. Because with a romance, you have to bring life. A story like this, you have to see that it's alive, really. And as I said, I'm. I hate sentimentality and still I'm drawn to these kinds of projects. So, so and to fight that sentimentality, you, you need to be honest and real with performances. I want to show another clip, but I have a question that kind of stems off of that because you're talking about, you know, you, you hate sentimentality and you're, you're drawn to these love stories. I mean, mm -hmm. not just Dear John, but Chocolat and um, Casanova. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these are all, you know, stories that are based around, you know, themes of love and mm -hmm. what, what, what does draw you to these stories? Is, is, is it just the fact that the characters are strong or? Um, I think at the core of it all, it's wanting to show people in all their flawed people, uh, people who you can relate to and recognize and you recognize your own shortcomings and you recognize that you're not alone in um, your irrational feelings and, uh, and uh, just to, I think that's a cathartic, if you find a moment that you um, probably not are willing to talk to other people about uh, or an experience that you don't want to talk about, but you see it up on screen and you recognize it and you see it as something that you have experienced, it's a great catharsis to, to be in a, uh, be in the theater and laugh at that situation together and know that you're not alone. I think it's all about that, really. 
So that's why I'm interested in real characters and in, in films that have irrational characters. The great example now is uh, 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 Silver Linings Yearbook, which I think is... Playbook, yeah. Playbook Yearbook. <laughs> which I think is a, a great example of a movie. I mean, I love that kind of storytelling. It's all about people. Wonderful. And we have a second clip from the film. Um, do you want to set that one up? Uh, just play it. I'll, I don't know what it is. We'll just play it. <laughs> so I have to ask, given what we're talking about, was any of that in the script, or was that all improv for the most part? Mm, mm, I think that was, no, that was not in the script. The falling in through the, uh, it was something I added like a week before we shot it. Yeah. Well, it works great. <laughs> um, now, moving on from the film, I was just, you know, doing my research on you before this, and I was so surprised to discover that you were ABBA's right-hand man before, you know, really making it as a, as a film director. I mean, you're responsible for most of the band's music videos. Is that correct? Now, can you first tell me how that came to be? I mean, that seems like such a unique um, opportunity as a, as a young filmmaker. Uh, I started out doing what you now call videos for pop groups for Swedish television in the mid-60s. So I did uh, clips with whomever visited Sweden and with Swedish pop groups. And I, I started out in 67. I started out doing a regular, on a regular basis doing those clips. And I shot Jimi Hendrix, who visited Sweden. And I did videos on, on uh, Eric Burden and the Animals and the Who and the Hollies. And so that's how I started. Th that's how I learned the craft to edit those things. And, and I shot, shot it myself, too. So that was my film school, doing those videos. Now you haven't done a musical yet, have you? No, I haven't. No. Has that ever been, you know... On your radar? Yes, it really has. I, w I wanted to do Mamma Mia, but they picked another. can't remember who they picked. But I was uh, kind of up for that. I was uh, second in line, I think, to do that. Second in line? I mean, I you're Swedish, and you've worked with them. so I'm, I'm so Yes, but it was the lady who had actually came up with the, uh, uh, the musical, who ended up directing, and she did a fantastic job, so... But I'd love to do a musical for sure, because I, I, I mean, I went to this school that specialized in music. I know how to write music. I do bad at playing instruments. I play the piano a little bit. But um, I love music and images. And um, yeah, that would be a great thing. Let's take a look at a clip from the film. It's a check flick, but I think it flicks for you guys too. So go go check it. I I think you might like it. The kid is adorable. Yes. So we're going to open it up to the audience, and um, someone's going to be coming around with a mic. So if you have a question, please just put your hand up, and we'll be sure to uh, have Lassie answer it for you. Right here. Hey, thanks for being here. Um, so uh, it read that your father, his day job was he was a dentist. But that he was a uh, he was also an inspiring filmmaker or an amateur filmmaker. So I'm wondering, how much influence did he have on you, you know, in becoming a filmmaker and pursuing this? And you know, how, what did he teach you? And when you reached that point where he couldn't teach you anymore, where did you seek mentorship beyond that? Yeah, he he meant everything really. I mean, before television, when there's a social event at home, there were all these films that were played on 8mm, down printed Chaplin to 8mm. I grew up watching Chaplin every week and there was like a screening for friends of Chaplin movies. My dad's documentaries, which he won prizes as a documentary filmmaker. It was all with this little Bell and Howell camera, this big, and 8mm, double eight, so and no sound. But I learned a lot from him and that was my inspiration really. He his parents didn't think it was a safe route to go, uh, the filmmaker route. So they, they, uh, he did what his father did, became a dentist. So it's like two generations of dentists. And I, I escaped it, thankfully. Have you ever had an untainted script? And um, this film looks like it's going to be a really great hit. 
Um, I think this film makes me believe in love again. I made one of those uh, and failed. <laughs> it was called The Shipping News. It was an impossible book, but I wanted to turn it into a film, and I did, and Miramax supported it. And it was a strange film. It was like a, a tapestry of ideas, bits and pieces of cookbooks and short stories and jokes and really weird. Newfoundland, it's on DVD. You can suffer through it. It's two hours. Kevin Space is in it and Julianne Moore. Kate Blanchett. Quite Kate Blanchett, yeah. yeah. But the untainted ones, I don't even really know what that is. Um, well, I've never done a script that I could shoot straight as is. If you're asking if there was such a script, I could go shoot it. No, that, that has never happened. You want to tweak and rewrite and polish and make it your own, always. Hi, how are you? Um, I was curious, that the whole, why was the reason that you went back to Sweden to actually shoot your film? Because you constantly work in the US for a long time. So what was the main reason that you went back to shoot a film that is so significant for you to mm -hmm. shoot? The main reason was really um, homesickness. I hadn't worked at home for 25 years. I never had a good reason to be in Stockholm for more than like a couple of days in a row. And I wanted to just spend time in Stockholm. And I'd never tried the thriller genre, which was uh, the, the next attraction. And there happened to be a great part for my wife in that story. So th those three reasons. And uh, Lena Olin is my wife, and she's doing a fantastic job as the wife in this story. And I hope it comes here. I have a shorter version of that film. It opened in uh, September in Sweden, and I felt it was on the long side, so I took 12 minutes out. I have now uh, uh, an improved version that I want to have someone distribute here in the United States. So that's the answer to that. Uh, Thursday morning, they showed My Life is a Dog on Turner Classic Movies. And that was an early film of yours. And you managed to have the world view of children, young people, which you, is considered a very difficult thing to do in film. So having conquered that early, <laughs> you felt that I, I climbed the mountain, and now I have a chance to do all kinds of, of exciting things. I'm very, that's my favorite film so far. It really is the, the best thing I've done. It's based on a Swedish novel. Uh, uh, it was just my cup of tea, really. But I do have this script now that I'm, I'm going to go to Los Angeles in two weeks and audition as a director for it to get it. <laughs> and it's almost like going back to that kind of story ma uh, movie making, which I'm eager to do. It's from a child's perspective, it's a family drama, and it's just my, you know, I, I'm hell-bent on getting that job, and I'm gonna go talk to the studio about it. Yes, I haven't been, uh, I've been on a strange uh, roller coaster ride, starting with films that were character-driven, uh, but indie-type indie, indie type movies, and, uh, uh, and I've made the detour into commercial, commercial fair like Dear John and this one. But I am kind of holding on to my interest in character and what where character can take a story. And, and I'm always eager to help create performances that feel authentic. And that's uh, what I think my movies have or should have in common. <laughs> hey, thanks again for being here. Um, <clears throat> my question is, what issues are you passionate about right now, and what documentaries do you see yourself doing in the next five years, if that's not too broad? Well, if I was going to do, go do a documentary, I would, I would go do it on the food industry. I, I think that would be a... Uh, they would need 
and a couple of more documentaries, I think, dealing with the, the fact that we're misled. <laughs> I turned vegan a year ago, and I want to tell the world why that's a good idea. So that's probably what I would do if I made a documentary next. Because uh, it's fascinating to know now that you can make yourself immune to so many diseases like uh, uh, heart attacks, you can avoid those, and even reverse heart disease by eating uh, vegan. So I thought that was a good deal. So I turned vegan and I'm now, according to what they say, immune. So I want to tell the world, I think it's going to be dec uh, generations of, of uh, we're misled so profoundly. So it's going to take generations to get on the right track here. Because you can't penetrate this country with with the idea that beef is bad for you. It's the, but it's the truth, and it should be spread, and it should be spread effectively. And I, I will probably turn to that next, if I could afford it. <laughs> um, so I just have one last question. Um, you've been so remarkably candid, you know, just over these past like this past half hour or so about you know what you consider to be your failures and you know where you want to go, etc. Have you always been that way about your past work, or did you, there there come a certain point in your career where you were just like, screw it, I'm gonna, you know, really be honest with myself and with my fans and those who follow my work? I don't know. If I, I mean, I'm, what I'm doing is, I can relate to what uh, Steven Soderbergh is doing. He does one for them, one for himself, <laughs> and that's what I've been doing, but I'm now 66 years old, and I feel like I have to find a way to keep doing the ones for myself, because uh, I owe that to myself and even to my audience a little bit. So the, the commercial fair, I, I'm proud of this as a, as a filmmaker. I also think I did a really good job with performances, but my heart, is of course in the, in the movies that are like My Life as a Dog or or sh or Gilbert Grape and those kinds of stories that are a bit more. I should stop labeling, but but, but that's where I, my heart is. That uh, the truly character-driven stories. But but I think I have a. Uh, I really love making movies, so. I can't slow down on that. I have to make at least one a year. <laughs> Please don't. Go slow down. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.